Hi and welcome to this podcast. Um, we are a psychologist and a philosopher discussing the big topic of AI and ethics. Myself, Marisa, I'm a psychologist at SkipAG, a cybersecurity and technology company. I'm conducting research on AI, on artificial intelligence, from a psychological perspective. So I'm an organizational psychologist, basically, with no tech background. We also have Megan Well on this podcast, and she is a philosopher, and um, she is working at ML Software House, a machine learning company, which is called Craftinity. So let's start with the first question. So research on ethics in AI is in full swing. Why aren't we expecting such a high, such a rise of ethics in AI? Well, if you look at the sci-fi movies like Terminator, Star Wars, and such, the bad consequence of technology gone wrong has always fascinated people. But um, it has always been rather fictional than reality for, let's say, the general public. But uh, with the tremendous developments in AI within the recent years, these, these fears are moving towards some potential reality, especially when well-respected luminaries like Stephen Hawking warn publicly that um, AI may be the best but last invention humanity has ever made. Yeah, so concerns include potential harm to privacy, discrimination, economic impacts like job loss, and also long-term effects on well-being. I mean, if you look at uh, that, that term uh, well-being, I mean, if you use public transportation, for example, you barely see anyone who is not on the phone, right? So um, we're we're not only dependent on our phones in a good way, uh, we are actually addicted with also many negative consequences from short-sightedness to Facebook depression and loneliness. So um, we need these so-called ethics to make sure that autonomous and intelligent systems are serving humanity, that they behave, that it is beneficial to humans, that there's trust between technology and people. So, yeah, it is about trusting technology, about trusting the providers, like the big tech giants, to do the right things. But it's also much more, in my opinion, about trusting humans. So, um, and truth, and the truth is that, I mean, yes, humans are good, and I truly believe in that, but they're also evil for various reasons. So... It is not evil machines, I fear. It is evil humans, I fear. Those who develop AI, um, those who use them intentionally to harm others, be it through weapons or cyber attacks. But there are also those who use them naively, short-sighted or under pressure, or bad things happen totally unintentionally. So uh, long story short, so as, as, as long as there are people who are evil and use technology for malicious purposes, there will be ethics for technology and machines. So, uh, yeah, hence forever. So we wonder, um, how can we deal with these complexities and threats that come along? How can we make sure that we c do not lose control over this? Well, you cannot stop the development of technology. Um, I mean, you may slow it down through regulations, but um, the pace of technology is way faster than our regulatory authorities. So that is a major challenge, which has been the case uh, with all dual-use technologies, for example, in the nuclear research field. You can use it for good, which is why we invest so much in AI, but you can also use it for bad, intentionally or not. Um, I'm, I'm pretty confident that the tech giants, for example, as well as the politicians and the general pop public have understood the need for this discourse about right and wrong, potential consequences, accountability, and responsibility, etc., um, which is shown in this rise of ethics in AI. However, there's still a giant gap to bridge between research and practice, and, and these roles are very unclear. For example, developers, yes, they need more knowledge about ethics or consumer psychology, sure. But, for example, me as a psychologist, I need to know more and need more knowledge about technology, um, as well as even to related fields like philosophy. So as a psychologist, I observe behavior, for example, but I do not judge between right and wrong. So the question we want to ask 
who does judge right and wrong? This is where ethics comes in. Psychology can tell you something about how we conceive of morality or how it looks in development, but it never can tell you if something is right or wrong. Ethics is not psychology. As Marissa mentioned, ethics is necessary to know if our technology is serving the right ends. But before we jump into that, we need to talk about what ethics is exactly in order to avoid confusion later down the road. We hear it a lot. We need ethics or we need an ethicist to check our technology, to check our algorithms. But what is ethics exactly? Ethics is a branch of philosophy. Philosophy is the pursuit of truth. Philosophy asks why. Why do we do science? Or should there be limitations on the advancement of the sciences and technology? Why? Both philosophy and science aim at truth. They're not opposed to each other. Science is concerned with knowledge that can be verified through the senses, for example, through experimentation. Science uses theories just like philosophy, but only ones that can be empirically verified. In this sense, psychology, although it emerged from philosophy, is seen more as a scientific discipline because it relies on empirically tested theories. Philosophy goes beyond the questions that science can answer because it's concerned with truths that cannot be determined wholly empirically. The field of ethics specifically tries to determine right and wrong by analyzing de and defending different concepts of value. So Megan, what are concrete examples of implementations of ethics in AI? More obvious examples include trying to anticipate the consequences of AI. So social concerns, analyzing potential threats to humans. Like, for example, on the news, we can read about the ability to mimic human-made text or creating photos of non-real celebrities with an almost scary likeness to reality. But let me give a more concrete example. I'm going to stick with machine learning and neural networks since this is the branch of AI with the most ethically ambiguous results. The most widely used method for training a neural network is called supervised learning. Supervised learning works by inferring a mathematical function from data. You can't just use any data. You need labeled data. But what does that mean? Someone has to sit down and actually mark each piece of data one by one. So for instance, if an engineer were trying to train a neural net to identify a cat within a photo, first someone would have to go through several images and label if a photo has a cat or not. I was managing a team that provided this kind of training data for our machine learning engineers. So the data is labeled according to an ontology or a taxonomy which is created by you. And depending on the field, you may need the help of an expert. The interesting thing is that actually this taxonomy can be arbitrary. It doesn't have to follow the way the world actually is or how things are actually defined. Uh, when we built our fashion search engine, for example, we differentiated between several different bags, such as a hobo bag, a handbag, etc. But some women might consider all of these bags to be shoulder bags. You get to pick the categories. So this taxonomy determines how the data is labeled. And the supervised algorithm takes this training data and finds the inferred function, essentially recreating the ontology that you originally created. If there are certain rules that the data labeling team followed, then the neural net would guess at these trends. So how does messing up the labeling ontology show up later? Okay, so for example, let's say you trained a neural net to, that controls an autonomous car to take a specific action when it sees a human on the road. It could mean the difference between life and death. A carelessly made ontology used for data labeling could have dire consequences. This is where the systematic approach of ethics is not only useful, but essential for avoiding unethical consequences. So there are a lot of unknowns and uncertainty when it comes to AI or machine learning and, and, and companies, politicians, even parents seem to be forced to understand or adopt AI, right? So. What I get asked a lot is, how do non-experts, business owners, even parents, how do they approach this topic? Yeah, I mean, from a psychologic perspective, this is one of the big, big problems. We're lacking cognitive freedom of choice. So me personally, what concerns is that we're moving towards a do-or-die relationship with AI. So it will be almost impossible to get away from AI as much as we cannot get away from climate change. So the f but the fact that we are forced or threatened, you know, like all these Terminator images or the constant man losing against machine news, 
th this leads to resistance, to denial, cynicism, downplay. And um, yeah, this, th this is a psychological phenomenon. It's called reactance. So when this reactance occurs, this, this phenomenon, we choose behaviors, even if they're absolutely, totally irrational, simply to restore our cognitive freedom of choice, to take back our personal sense of control. And this can be a big challenge, especially in consumer psychology, when you aim to convince customers to buy your products, whether it's a car or a robotic vacuum cleaner. Consumers, like all human beings, they want freedom of choice. And we need to figure out ways to make people want to explore AI by themselves, not because they're forced to do so, because they understand that there's a need for it. So one of the key isu issues for sure is we have to change the way we talk about AI. So I think um, we massively have to change the tone of the conversation and move away from a threat and fear towards clear facts, towards vision, towards why, to, yeah, to create our own relationship with AI and a new level of trust. And this brings us actually back to the one of the most important questions. Can we trust AI? So yeah, from, from my experience, uh, trust in AI is really low. We have to think critically without cynicism. So it's not about worrying to be um, replaced and hate all progress. It's rather asking, what can AI do for me? How will it impact my life? And then adapt or act accordingly. It says almost every job or parts of it are replaceable or can be automated at some time in the future. So um, yeah, now is the time to reevaluate your situation, to ask yourself important questions like, what is it that makes you feel irreplaceable? And this means you have to ask questions like, what do you do to create value for your tribe? What do you do to serve your need for connection? And um, this is an important question because I don't think it is AI per se that feeds our fears. I think it's rather the fear of losing human connection because this human connection is what makes us irreplaceable. Now, and I think that's uh, pretty good news for me as um, uh, what I think is I strongly believe that you cannot take the human out of AI. And this is extremely important. The biggest challenge right now is trying to change the image that AI already has in the general public. Many people I talk to don't even distinguish between a robot and software. Both people in the industry and the general public ask if AI is going to take over the world. There's a lot of uncertainty about what AI is, what machine learning is. It's crucial and essential to prepare people. AI is powerful and has ridiculous potential. One way to build trust from a technological standpoint is through integrating human value systems into the software. This is about those ontologies I spoke about earlier. We integrate our beliefs into a system when we make a decision and act in a certain way, which in turn trains the algorithm. Like Marissa said, it's not that AI itself is racist, the bias originates with us. One problem is that many companies choose to outsource their labeling to third-party vendors. When companies outsource labeling, the responsibility for creating those precise ontologies adhering to a specific ethical framework is lost in bureaucracy. There's a good article about this from Forbes. Check out AI bias and the people factor in AI development. When we find out later about those little slip ups, for example, if an autonomous car were to injure or even kill a pedestrian, then it becomes a question of responsibility. Who will be held accountable if mistakes are being made in the data labeling pipeline? It's not so hard to imagine the severity of consequences. So what can we do? One solution is to make those ontologies and label data in-house. That's what we did at Craftinity. With a team close by, we can make sure those taxonomies adhere closely to reality. For instance, we labeled CT scans of lungs to develop a machine learning product that would give a second opinion to radiologists on a cancer diagnosis. We included several doctors in the labeling process. If we were to mislabel data and the product were to go live, the consequences could be devastating. Another solution is to expand the team to address those non-technical dimensions. 
We need people who understand psychology to communicate to the public about controversial topics. If we want to have ethical AI, we need to address issues to their technical core with the assistance of people watching out for the ethical dimension. We want to build a technology that's trustworthy to the public. Yeah, so trust seems to be one of the big topics when it comes to AI. As a company, I mean, I often get asked what is important when um, creating a trustworthy image or company culture. Yeah, so it's very true. Trust is one of the most critical influencing factors when it comes to interaction, no matter if human interaction or human-machine interaction. I mean, without trust, there, there will be no families, no houses, no markets, no religion, no politics, <laughs> basically no rocket science. And um, according to Rachel Bossman, we humans, through trust, can cope with uncertainty. And this uncertainty is always some a place between the known and the unknown. So we need trust as a mechanism, basically, to cope with these complexities. And as a company, if, if you want to explore your trust image, you need to look at, uh, at questions and definitions from various perspectives. Uh, most importantly, or would be a systemic perspective. So you may want to look at the individual person, like characteristics of your target group or your employees. You can look at the process. How do you build trust? How do you maintain trust? How do you develop trust from a consumer perspective? And also what happens if trust is destroyed and how can you regain it? What are the effects of it? You have to be clear of all the actors and uh, the roles. Who is to be trusted? Is it the provider? Is it uh, the, the, the salesperson? Is it the brand? Is it, the, um, yeah, what is it? Is it the process or the competences or the situation? So there are many, many factors that have to be evaluated. And also very important is the situation. Are we talking about a high risk situation? Like for example, self-driving cars? Or are we talking about an AI-driven chatbot in customer service? These are very two different situations, right? So um, we have to focus as a company on why and vision. I've mentioned that before. I mean, machines can read x-rays better and way faster. Machines can translate faster. Where and, and what, how does the human in this loop look like? Where's the human factor in AI? Uh, unfortunately, yeah, there are no predefined answers. You basically have to set up your own research department or partner with one. I mean, but the good news is we are still at a point where we are not pushed against the wall. We are at a point where we can ask questions, where we can explore, evaluate, and so on. And at one point, um, we can define these answers and th set these standards for the future. But yeah, from a very pragmatic point of view, the most valuable, uh, valuable advice for a company wanting to integrate AI into their strategy is, uh, um, yeah, speculate about a certain future and then take simple steps towards them and do them right. Don't try anything just to be with the cool kids. Keep it simple and make it work well. So, from a company perspective, Megan, you as a philosopher, what are the right and critical questions to ask? We should be considering what we can do to improve the social acceptance of AI in a transparent way. We should be thinking about ways to improve the social understanding of AI by removing the hype from the actually valuable technology. In any case, AI is here and will continue to develop. We have to figure out how we want to position ourselves, both from the business perspective and the perspective of humanity. Do we want to use this technology that imitates humans in order to pursue higher goals, or will we merely use it for our own advantage? Can we find a place for technology in our humanity? And more immediately, what are the consequences for accepting this technology into our daily lives? So the question is, how do you keep things human in a world where everything is interconnected, where everything is monitored, tracked, and becomes hyper-efficient? Yeah, I mean, what, 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 what keeps fascinating me is, is, is the fear I observe uh, in people. Um, and this is where I think is a good place to start, observing humans, trying to understand their fears, trying to understand their hopes. 
um, we have to step back from our enthusiasm for progress as well as from our resistance and check back with the human factor. I mean, one thing is for sure, as Sam Harris said, there's absolutely no way that we'll stop creating better and more intelligent machines unless the earth will explode and humanity will be erased. So we sort of have to find a way to deal with it. A good way to deal with it, I think, is always to ask yourself questions and envision or play with certain scenarios. So a good question is, how would you use an AI? Um, even if it's kind of crazy, because uh, there's some underlying needs behind this craziness we need to figure out. So uh, this question, for example, it forces you to think about the character of your tasks. Like, are they repetitive? Are they creating value? And very important to me, are they fun? <laughs> What do you enjoy doing? Yeah, but uh, your creativity is often rather disturbed when we're pushed against the wall and um, fear that our jobs and our purpose in life will be gone soon. So, yeah, but it's not the task at hand, the title or the skills that make us irreplace irreplaceable, right? As already said, what makes us unique is the human connections we establish in life. And this is important. Why? Because technology is simply a main to an end and not the end itself. And we tend to forget this. To make sure that, that this, this rise of the machines and AI is not the fall of humanity, we as humans have to understand that now is the time for us to rise up.